Welcome back to the channel, people. Tonight we're going to get into Palantir's moat. How big is it? <laughs> it's a big moat, trust me. Um, all right, so the first thing we want to talk about are sort of the types of moats out there, right, in the technology world. This is one I kind of call the algorithmic moat, right? It's proprietary algorithms that are usually distributed in, like, compiled software uh, that create a barrier to entry because they're, they take a long time to create, and generally someone entering that space isn't going to spend time recreating something you've already kind of cornered the market with. There's just not a lot of innovation in those spaces. Usually we quickly reach like the capabilities of the hardware that are out there. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, once companies have built up products that deliver on these algorithms, it's very difficult for companies to compete in that space. And there are some drawbacks though. And it's because specifically you got to ship these things in compiled software is that it's difficult to distribute them as a web application. Um, they tend to lose their performance if you're running these algorithms on a server. Uh, they really need to be embedded uh, on the device to have most of the effect. And then it makes web apps difficult because of this. And generally, the way they've been trying to solve this is with a language called WebAssembly that's taking these compiled algorithms and letting them run inside a web browser. And AutoCAD is doing this, and the company you're about to see in a second is doing this, or attempting to. But there are problems, and, and the other is that performance is usually really bad, right? So these algorithms are generally super heavy. Um, they, these applications don't typically scale. Um, and, and it's because they're running on the user's, like on a single device, on the user's app. They're, they can't funnel through hundreds or thousands of people. Uh, and so that's an inherent limitation of something that is resource intensive and needs to be running on a physical device. Um, also, the, the resulting architectures built around these things are typically a desktop model. And this is really bad for SaaS, SaaS applications that are meant to scale out on modern cloud architectures, right? And so a good example of this is Adobe. Uh, I know, know this deeply. I worked uh, with Adobe for years. Uh, I worked for an Adobe certified solutions partner in the Bay Area. Spent 10 years doing that and um, built lots of, lots of back office applications, consumer products, all kinds of stuff in the web to print space. So I really know their um, Adobe Core library well. It's highly protected. Um, you know, it's the company has um, you know attempted to try and get it in the web space, but they were really late to the party. And this creates what I like to call the the ass and wind scenario, right? Because you're stuck on a desktop, because you're stuck in this sort of algorithm algorithmic moat, you can't take advantage of new use cases, right? And so Canva came out of nowhere in five years and built a $40 billion company centered around use cases Adobe was ignoring that were popular for building social media posts, for, you know, getting um, things ordered for a web to print application, building, you know, just little bits of art that a novice user could put together that Adobe wasn't focused on because they were stuck in their algorithmic moat. That's not to say Adobe isn't a killer company. They certainly are. It's just a different, the, the algorithmic moat is a different kind of moat, right? So you, it's not the only technology moat. What's the other? Well, we've got the operations moat, right? And um, a, good op a good example of the operations moat is what Google has done over the last 10 years. Um, these two guys, Hiram Wright and Titus Winters, uh, they're amazing. I've learned a lot from these guys. This, um, the book Lessons Learned from Programming at Google is fantastic. I think anyone in software engineering should read it. But Google has been the innovator in this space, and no one does it better than Google. Um, there's also the government moat. Um, you know, basically, uh, you know, government offering government software is pretty hard to do. Uh, there's huge upfront costs. Uh, there's no single path for all agencies. You know, it's feast or famine. There's massive regulation. Uh, On-prem support is a must, and this is often overlooked because you can't just deploy out to like a standard cloud, you know, most of these are in high security data centers. So, um, you know, government moats are hard to build. Luckily, Palantir is in that space. And, and a good example of that would, besides Palantir, a bigger example would be like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, right? This is the, the these companies bread, bread and butter. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, these are all examples of technical moats, but, but the one, uh, oh, and also, by the way, uh, the DOD intends to grow its audience, so you know companies that rely on a government moat might be experiencing more competition soon because the needs of the DOD are growing, right? They're, they want to get into hypersonics and biotechnology and autonomy, like fully autonomous and, um, 
uh, models that can you know be active in the battlefield this space is growing fast and so competition is ramping up obviously palantir is well positioned for this but in any case you know that that competition is ramping up but let's get back to the category let's get back to the operations mode and why it's the category king of all of these modes right if you read any of these three books these are sort of must reads in the technology space what you're going to quickly realize is that all of these companies that were built by these people um, relied heavily on making small incremental improvements to massively scale their business to support hundreds of engineers. And it's really, really difficult to do that. It's difficult to actually get engineers to contribute to code in a productive way when you're trying to scale to hundreds or thousands of engineers, right? So um, in my opinion, the operations mode is the category king. And this culture of innovation uh, enabled by the op by operational success, it, it this it enables this culture that's going to build innovation for decades. Uh, and it really is driven around small incremental improvements that improve your operations, that then improve your products, right? But why? <laughs> like, why is the operations moat uh, king, right? Well, because science, right? So, like, Lehman's Laws of Software Evolution, they've been around since the uh, 70s, I believe. They've gone through several iterations recently, uh, like in 2010. But the laws describe the balance between the forces driving new development, developments on one hand and the forces that slow down progress on the other. Anyone who works in software understands this. The more code you add, the harder it becomes to add more code, right? Because complexity is growing. And eventually, that if you don't engineer that system correctly, it will collapse under the, beneath the weight of all that complexity. And that's why operations is super important, right? And then Roger S. Pressman added, in my opinion, some really important work where they realized that it's really impossible to thoroughly test an IT system of any real size, right? So if you plan to grow up to a $100 billion company with thousands of engineers, you're never going to test your way out of this problem. And he demonstrated this with a small 100-line program that generated like a trillion paths. It would have taken like over 3,000 years to fully test. And that was just a 100-line program. Interesting, right? Software is complex, guys. It's really, really tough to build. Um, and and my favorite, you know, the the Godfather, Rich Hickey. And by the way, all these people are some serious OGs in the software business. If you if you don't know who they are, get to know their names. Uh, but Rich Hickey is the man. Um, but this quote is so on point for why the operations mode matters, and it's because simplicity is hard work, right? But there's a huge payoff. The person who has a genuinely simpler system, a system made out of genuinely simpler parts is going to be able to affect the greatest change with the least work. He's going, to, he's going to kick your ass. He's going to spend more time simplifying things up front. And in the long haul, he's going to wipe the plate with you because he'll have the ability to change things while you're struggling to push elephants around. 100% on point. And because, why? Because science, that's why. Okay. So um, Palantir's operations mode, let me explain it. From what I've gathered from my own research, I'm not giving up anything that... I know about that was shown to me. I'm just taking things that are publicly available that you can all verify. Uh, let's take their Git innovation. Git is a um, uh, change management system for software, and it lets us merge changes from developers, keep you know revert changes, keep track of changes. Um, it's an indispensable tool to every modern company today. But Palantir is innovating in the space. They came up with a novel merge algorithm to solve their problems. They came up with their own novel sparse checkout system, which basically allows you to create, create these gigantic repos you could never check out on a single machine because they're too big, but create a system whereby specific teams can, can check out parts of that repo and work effectively. This is really hard. This is something I'm actually working on right now at my company. Uh, also, they built a whole mono repo architecture, right, that enables core product development with a thin layer of customization for their clients. Again, this is a massive repo. It will never fit on a single machine. Um, and building mono repos isn't easy. It's the subject of a lot of literature Google has put out, and it's something that I've spent a lot of my career mastering. And Palantir has got this down, okay? Or at least they are starting to get this down. Uh, there are very few companies that achieve this, by the way. This is not something that many companies ever achieve at any scale. Um, I, I think the number would be in the single digits. So uh, just keep in mind how special this is, like some of the things they're achieving. And all, the, all these are available on Medium, on their blogs, right? So like, let's go through some of the things that you should look at maybe if you want to understand more about this. So there's a five-part series on optimizing uh, Git machinery on Palantir's blog that's fascinating if you're an engineer, but probably like, not going to make any sense if you're not. Um, but I want you to pay attention to this one thing here. So like refactoring large code paces. At, at Palantir, we have a few large-ish monorepos roughly on scale with the size of the Linux kernel. Yeah, that's pretty big, you know? Um, but, but so... You know, they, 
in order to work effectively in these mono repos, they, they have to be able to engineer a system by which teams can check out the things they need and nothing else to be efficient so you can get changes pushed quickly. You're not sitting there waiting forever for the repo to download or, or um, compile or any of those other things. The other cool thing, this article renaming um, uh, directory hierarchies, I, I was able to speak with one of the engineers in that article, like comments in Medium, and he was explaining to me how they've um, faced some challenges in the way they used to provide customization layers for their clients. You know, not, not every foundry is 100% identical. They, they do customize it for each client. But in the comments, he told me, you know, they used to have this really foobar way of doing it, but now they've got a really good way to manage a, a shared code and collaborate effectively. And that's something I spent five years building, right? So like, I spent five years building a system that enabled the same kind of thing. It is not easy. It takes lots of revisions. Um, just when you think you kind of have it right, you realize there are some gaps and you didn't realize like there was code maybe you couldn't share properly or incorporate changes easily. Maybe you're like, you know, have stuck manually having to reapply changes. But in any case, this is really hard. It's really difficult to provide a thin layer of customization on top of a core product and very few people do it at scale. Um, so also Apollo, right? Their operations moat is massive with Apollo. Apollo is the most underappreciated and overlooked product I think out there today. Um, you see this little arrow pointing to this, where I'm saying massive innovation here. What you guys need to understand is normally in a normal system uh, where we push uh, builds and push them out to live environments, that portion where you see publish, define, and register the build system, that's the thing that's actually pushing the software out to like say AWS or GCP. It centralizes all of the knowledge, like the build system traditionally has been the central place where we put all of the knowledge about how to deploy to an environment. But you can imagine that's not super scalable. Like having to write a build for every type of software that needs to go to every type of environment has never been done before. Uh, people have tried it, you know, like Terraform does a pretty good job, but it's not all the way there. Um, the, the serverless framework had pro has promised multi-cloud for years and has been unable to fully deliver, has been un unable to deliver it. Vendia, a new startup, uh, AWS focused, and they're promising one year, one day they may be multi-cloud, and I hope they are. They, they got some fantastic people over there, but it's a really hard, hard problem. No one's been able to solve this yet. Well, Palantir has. <laughs> so uh, this little innovation that they did, they used what I like to refer to, it's essentially an inversion of control technique, where instead of having the thing that would normally do the control flow, you invert it over to this other thing in which the main controller doesn't know what's going on, right? And so they built these agents that run inside AWS, and they know how to deploy a specific, um, a specific system, and they connect to this registry to find whenever new builds uh, are released for that system. And within there is the protocol ba baked into these agents of how to interact with that registry, but the agent contains all of the specific details about how to deploy that system. Now, I can imagine one day developers, if they ever get their hands on this, being able to build little Apollo agents for just about anything, TVs, cell phones, you know, video cameras, you name it, okay? So this is a massively scalable system because the protocol is baked for the registry that inverts control in a way that enables massive scalability of deployment targets without needing to centralize that under one set of rules or one technology. Unbelievable innovation, totally overlooked. This is actually powering a data decentralization model that I'm working on at my company right now. Like after I discovered this and I, I literally found it in a video. It was like nothing that, that, that was proprietary and shared with me. I just found it in a video on YouTube. I was like, oh my God, this is huge. We can use this to build a decentralized data exchange basically. And so um, anyway, it's something that I'm working on, but this is massive innovation, totally overlooked. Um, and I hope people start to appreciate Apollo more. Let's also talk about their modules, right? Palantir has designed a modular system, right? Like, remember when I was talking about simplicity is hard work? Modular, module, modules make software simple, right? It decomposes problems into smaller domains instead of putting everything into one big ball of goo. And so um, this, you know, enables Palantir to compose foundries for specific industries and their verticals. And it enables them to do it quickly and they can actually scale teams around those specific industries and verticals. And we're seeing them do that in real time. Um, and, and also their modular framework allows for pluggable AI and ML, such as Big Bear and IBM Watson. That's a tough thing to do, to build a system in which you're agnostic as to the components from other third-party vendors that you're putting in there, especially when you've clearly had some foresight that like AI and ML will probably be the commodity at some point. Uh, but yeah, this shit is hard. You know, like modular software is really, really hard. It's, 
you know, you have to do it across front end and back end. It's uh, all layers of your stack, really. It's across every language you're gonna use. And so Palantir has really managed to put this all together, right? And so Palantir's operations mode is huge, right? It's, it's uh, a mode of innovation. It's not near Google's mode of innovation and operations. They're probably not gonna be there for a really, really long time. I mean, Google is incredible. Um, there's just no other word for it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's tracking, man, and it will dominate their competition. And let's take like who I see as the competitors right now, like AWS and some a little bit of GCP, but mostly AWS and maybe Databricks. Um, you know, AWS is, it, it, it's going to fail in its ability to maintain the services they've built. And I'll tell you why. It's the leading indicator is the API economy. AWS has created a horrible developer experience through their control plane. And I don't want to spend an inordinate amount of time for my developers learning the AWS control plane and maintaining the AWS control plane because it adds absolutely zero value to my company. Every hour that a developer spends doing that is time they're not building features, right? And the API economy has found a way to still leverage AWS, but solve this problem of infrastructure as code and the AWS control plane sucking so hard. So Versal is a good example. This is enabling React developers to deploy a live application to a global infrastructure in seconds with no infrastructure as code. This is a huge innovation. It's also it's actually a bunch of different frameworks. It's pretty much every modern UI framework out there. You can put apps together now, guys, insanely fast with Versal. And they have support for um, you know the best frameworks out there like Next.js. Uh, Fauna is another great example. This is a distributed database, a document database that um, you know is available via an API, and the infrastructure is completely abstracted, and you just get you know you just get a awesome database and nothing else. You can start writing your app code right away. It also you know and also DGraph is another example similar to Fauna, but it's made for GraphQL, which is a, a query language created by Facebook. It incorporates a graph database. Uh, and another one that I love, the Service Cloud. I, I work with these people. Um, just inter I just had a great interview actually with. Uh, the folks at serverless chats the other day. Um, but these are examples of how they're abstracting the underlying cloud technology and they're building tools that will actually deliver a good experience and deliver business value immediately, right? And so Palantir is gonna outcompete through this, this continuous innovation that builds an opinionated e ecosystem, not a single component that delivers value today, right? And so, this is why, you know, to me, their, their operations mode is huge. They figured out how to build an ecosystem that is opinionated about how you'll operate and abstract away all of the underlying complexity related to AWS and GCP and Azure and the edge and anything else through Apollo. That's fucking phenomenal, dude. Like, let's just take a minute to appreciate how amazing that is. And so analysts are never going to understand this, guys. They'll never understand this shit. It, unless you work in software, it's really hard to appreciate how hard this is. You know, development at scale is not like you sitting down with a GitHub project. When you're trying to get hundreds and thousands of developers to contribute to a code base and build a product, that shit is hard. Uh, so now you're all in possession of massive alpha, right? You can thank me later. Uh, but yeah, no, how big is Palantir's moat? It's, it's huge. Um, you know, I, I really hope that, you know, you guys have come to appreciate some of what I see and what people in the industry would see as a massive moat, a, a massive operations moat. Um, and it's continuing to grow and compound every day. All right, guys. Thanks.